call him an author. So I just <laughs> asked him, so then who wrote your books? <laughs> <laughs> but um, truly, uh, quite remarkable works of uh, scholarship. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this whole understanding of Hinduism, Hindutva, uh, your uh, coinage, which I like, Indic Renaissance, which is different, you feel, from Hindu nationalism. We'll go one by one quickly, and then we'll get into the discussion, so sure. that everyone has an understanding of what we're talking about. Sure. Hinduism, Hindutva, Indic Renaissance. Quick definitions. Way of life, not a religion is the first definition for Hinduism, which has been forced to conform to the narrow confines of religion thanks to the constitution's Christian take on religion, one. Second, Hindutva is a religio-political civilizational manifestation of the need to preserve the self. And therefore, it has a resistive component and as I said before, it is the need or the necessity of the times that Hinduism lives in. Indic Renaissance is perhaps my way of looking at it, or perhaps I'm one of the stakeholders, which is to say that political Hindutva alone cannot do the job, because at the end of the day, it has a tendency to reduce nuance. It has a tendency to perhaps exploit a particular genuine sentiment for political ends, rightly so. However, Societal Hindutva perhaps means the percolation of Hindu consciousness at every level in different fields, which includes culture, education, which was discussed today extensively, uh, I think two sessions ago, uh, legal thinking, political theories, environment, economics, and whatnot. So therefore, the need to increase Hindu consciousness across the board, independent of what happens at the political level, is perhaps the reason why I would want to call it as Indic Renaissance. In that particular sense, it is all encompassing and it is much more comprehensive than political Hindutva. So are we in the age of Indic Renaissance or, or are we at the cusp of it? I would say we are barely at the beginning of it. Um, and uh, I think there's a long way to go because you see over the last three or four years, Conversations have been repeatedly and repetitively revolving only around the question of what the Marxists and, let's say, the Nehruvian coterie did to history in terms of distortion. I think that discussion is more or less done and dusted. Now I think it's time to implement an action and put out the work. Because after a point, it ends up taking the shape of endless victimhood, where there is real no, let's say, there is no value addition. So today, if someone tells me, you know, why isn't that we aren't doing this in history? Why aren't, why aren't we actually incorporating this as part of a knowledge system? I'd say, why don't you pose the question to the people in power? That is the, I mean, that's the audience to which this question must be, must be aimed at. Unfortunately, we don't seem to be doing that. So I think now we are past the identification of the problem. Now the question is, what is the solution to address this particular problem? How serious are we about it? is history, so when you look at, let's say, revisioning of history, it's not revisionism in that particular sense, but it is perhaps, as previous panelists put forth, presenting, let's say, a clear picture along with facts. But then it's not going to be limited to the realm of history alone. When you look at history, you're not going to be just limited to history of politics, but you're also going to be looking at history of education, history of culture, and whatnot, history of science in this country, so on and so forth. So that, I think, in that particular direction, NEP is perhaps a baby step of a baby step of a baby step. So Why let's do you see. say that? Because uh, when the NEP came out, I clearly felt it was a half measure. The government was perhaps, and I, I, I'm not someone who can put myself in the shoes of the government, but so I'm sure there are 108 considerations that they have in mind. But I believe that the government is constantly holding back its punches in this particular direction, either because of lack of confidence with respect to what it wishes to present, or because although it thinks that it is justified in the position that it wishes to take, it doesn't know how to respond to or parry the attacks on the usual suspects in the media and academic establishment. Therefore, That's hardly any left. No, I don't think so, ma'am. As, as someone who practices in the legal fraternity, take it from me, keep left is the principle still in several areas, and not just when it comes to Indian roads. So, uh, I've seen that way too often. 
I do not want to suffer under the delusion that political victory translates to a shift in the academic Overton window or a shift in the cultural window. And dare I also say this, unfortunately I think there is a certain degree of cultural continuity or historical continuity even in the manner that this particular dispensation views at its own history. So when people read my books, they tend to assume that this is supposed to be some kind of a stick to beat the Congress with or the left with. Unfortunately, they've got it wrong. That's not what I'm trying to say. Both the left and the right and the very existence of terms such as left and the right points to the problem here, which is that we seem to lack originality and the confidence to draw from our own civilization. And that, I would say, equally afflicts the current establishment to a significant degree, but perhaps not to the degree that it afflicts the Congress establishment or the other political options that are available at this point. So I would say that no option today is ideal, and maybe that is always going to be the case, but I hope we start moving in a particular direction where at the very least we take incremental steps in addressing and correcting this particular position. Because you see, let me give you what, what exactly am I talking about. When it comes to issues such as caste, and its nexus with Hindu dharma, or its history in this particular country, the origin of untouchability, so on and so forth. I think it is political arithmetic that is dictating the course of how we wish to see history, as opposed to history dictating how politics should be redesigned. So therefore, on one hand, we end up constantly being told that caste is evil, caste is evil, caste is evil. Fantastic, then give up caste arithmetic altogether when it comes to elections. Why don't you walk the talk when it comes to this? So when it comes to your political arithmetic, you want to accept this particular reality, which means you have not been able to do away with it. But when it comes to history, it's almost as if we reduce that entire complex social system to something which the white man has given you to understand. And you start looking at your own social structures through the prism of, let's say, the received wisdom of that particular colonizer. So I think that is a problem that plagues the current dispensation as much as it did the previous dispensation. The only good part is this dispensation is perhaps a big tent of several non-left ideas, and therefore there are several alternative voices within this particular camp as well. So in that particular sense, perhaps the movement of 2014 to 2023 has been that for all practical purposes, Congress, or let's say what it represents, is no more the subject of the debate. The entire debate has shifted to this side. And now this side has multiple perspectives to argue and thrash out within itself. So there are some people who believe that Hindutva stands for Hindu modernity. And people like me effectively say, at the very least have the guts and the confidence to junk this word called modernity because it has a very colonial undertone to it. Please understand its origins. And think of Hindutva as Hindu decolonization from a cultural and a psychological and a consciousness perspective. So that is the current debate. And I am of the conscious view that this particular debate will perhaps chart the course of the next 15 to 20 years at the very least. So we may not ultimately end with a situation where either side wins comprehensively, and it's not a victory in that particular sense, but you may end up with some kind of a hybrid outcome. A hybrid between decolonialization and modernity? So Hindutva decoloniality and Hindutva modernity. I think that is where the battle is at this point. And what will that hybrid look like? So it's like this, Hindu modernity is being presented as the new version of Hindutva by quite a few people who seem to somehow be comfortable, who seem to be comfortable marrying Savarkar and Ambedkar and, and Periyar. <laughs> First, I mean, I don't know how that actually works. Uh, they want to somehow co-opt Savarkar, they also want to co-opt Ambedkar, they also want to co-opt Periyar, and on the same issue. I can understand for different issues it makes sense. But on the very same issue of Hindu dharma caste and so on and so forth. Hindu decoloniality says, First, understand the system for what it is. Then ask yourself whether it makes sense to constantly bash that particular system for what it was. And then ask yourself whether what it exists as is relevant and can, can it coexist with contemporary situations and circumstances and the demands of the current day. That is a much better approach than appropriating a few icons or a few, let's say, tall leaders merely because it has a certain political appeal and it caters to a particular vote, uh, let's, say uh, let's say voting audience, and then somehow recraft history. That's not how history is supposed to work. And which is pre precisely why I have very clear reservations with respect to outsourcing Indic Renaissance and Hindutva altogether to the political um, stakeholders. Because in their hands, it is always a creature of compromise, it's always a creature of convenience, and it's always a creature of political correctness, something that history should never be subjected to. History is always politically incorrect. And it's important to address it head on, whatever it may be. 
if history tells me that certain aspects of certain smritis are indeed racist in nature or they indeed perpetuate a certain supremacy, I would simply ask, okay, then how do I look at that particular portion of history for what is good, what is bad and what is ugly and what do I take from there? So neither am I asking for whitewashing of everything. But I'm certainly not going to be comfortable with the very same mistakes that the Congress committed now that it comes to a different entity altogether. I've said this before, I think Congress is not an entity, it's a preta atma. So merely because it may have lost political, let's say, relevance in some portions of the country doesn't mean that the spirit has not traversed into the current dispensation. There are certain portions of the current dispensation who have appropriated that preta atma. I think uh, there needs to be some kind of exorcism that is performed. But since I'm a Hindu, I won't resort to exorcism. I'll go to Tantra. <laughs> you mustn't be a very popular man with the current dispensation then. No, I think I have my uses. <laughs> Which is? <laughs> Which is, I think, when a particular position or an issue cannot be articulated well, or if I believe, so for instance, I'll give you a clear uh, example. There was this marital rape petition that was pending before the division bench of the Delhi High Court, a special bench was constituted for it. And for those who don't know, uh, Sai is an engineer from Anna University and a lawyer from IIT, which I find very interesting. So I've been a lawyer for 14 years and they say that after a husband vanishes for seven years, he's effectively dead. I've not been an engineer for 14 years, so I'm no more an engineer. <laughs> no more okay. an engineer. So I am a lawyer, I will yeah. die a lawyer. So this issue was about whether the court has the power to recognize a new species of rape, such as marital rape. This was the question and I'm sure there are law students here and they'll find it interesting. The government was not taking a clear position for whatever reason and I think the very clear reason that was given and I think which is very legitimate was considering that this is a subject of law and order, states do have a right when it comes to this. So the government was actually respecting the, the, the concept of federalism and say that we are not going to take a unilateral position in this, we need to consult everybody else. But somehow the Delhi High Court was keen on proceeding with the matter with a lot of expedition. and so with no clear position forthcoming from the government because it was still in, pro in the process of consultation, stakeholders such as me and others basically felt that an alternative position needs to be presented. And that alternative position is recognition of marital rape is justified, but it cannot come through the instrumentality of the court because the court is not a legislative body. A court cannot lay down evidentiary standards. It is not mandated by the constitution. It is not equipped to do so by design. It needs to consult marriage counselors, social anthropologists and whatnot. It does not have the benefit of their experience. Lawyers are not experts on everything from anthropology to gynecology, so let us be very clear about what our limitations are. So therefore, in those instances, I decided to jump into the picture, thanks to a couple of interveners. So in those instances, perhaps I think my, my presence is valued, but I'm not doing this to be valued by anybody. I believe in a particular position and therefore I'm going to pursue it. If somebody asks me between the two dispensations and between the two ideological hues, so to speak, which way you tilt, well, saffron is my color. I own it very clearly. I have no problems with it. I'm not, able, I'm not going to run away from it. Although, of course, this is blue, so it's still okay. So the point is, uh, I don't think that there is any equation between me and the government which allows me to put a finger on it and say, oh, today they love me, today they hate me. I have no idea. There is, there is no direct line of communication. On certain issues, I know for a fact that there are interests or there are overlaps. Some are happy and some are perhaps just a matter of, let's say, coincidence. And beyond that, there is no equation. So if the government likes me, fine. If it doesn't, so be it. It really doesn't make a difference to my life. One of the issues in your definition of Hindutva is the idea of peaceful versus pacifism. pacifist Hindu. Yes. Hinduism, yes. yes, which is something that a lot of people have concerns about because in a way it calls for a weaponization of the religion. Mm. And it also can, in a way, others, other rises, mm. uh, um, Muslims in particular. Mm. Why do you think this is so important okay. that you have to have an understanding that the martial element of Hinduism was something that was taken away from it right. and which we now need to re, uh, sort of re revitalize or re-energize in Hinduism. I am not asking for weaponization of Hinduism. I am basically saying at least recognize the fact that your gods have weapons in their hands. <laughs> okay. 
And but they also have other things. That's not the so only. So here's the thing. So I would say you may have a book and a weapon and you may have a lotus and a weapon, in which case peace and power go hand in hand. Okay. My point is that a weak person who is emasculated has absolutely no bargaining chip to begin with and has no place at the negotiating table. So I think that's the fool's paradise to live in. And as much as I would want to believe as a constitutional, let's say as a, as a practicing constitutional and commercial litigator, that the monopoly of violence or the monopoly of force must be exclusively with the government or the state. I've seen how it is wielded and I've also seen how it is not conveniently. And I've also seen instances where uh, entire swathes of population have been left to their own devices to protect themselves. The latest of instances being the anti-Hindu violence under uh, the current dispensation of the West Bengal government uh, in the aftermath of the elections in 2021. And as someone who argued before the constitution bench of the Calcutta High Court on this particular matter, specifically enumerating instances of mass gang rapes, I know for a fact that the outsourcing of um, the monopoly over violence to the state has not exactly helped. Therefore, I'm not saying let's be unconstitutional. I'm not asking for militarization. I'm not asking for any of those aspects. I'm simply saying is self-defense part of the bundle of fundamental rights, the amorphous bundle of fundamental rights that the constitution spells out. The constitution expressly spells out a few fundamental rights over and above which the Supreme Court has spelled out 21 further rights at the very least. Now, therefore, I'm asking myself this basic question, is the right to self-defense, not the right of wanton violence, not the right of preemptive action, the right of self-defense, is that something which is beyond the pale of reasonableness? In my humble and clear opinion, it is not. That is where I stand. Now, coming to the question of otherization, well, as long as religions exist, one will always be the other to the other. Finish the concept of religion and then we'll say, oh, there is no such thing as being the other. Second, but it doesn't necessarily imply hatred. Of course not. But let us strike a very clear distinction between the recognition of the other and hatred for the other. Yeah. I'm clearly on that particular point. Now, I'll go a step further. If my existence as a polytheistic, murti-worshipping Hindu, practicing Hindu, is an anathema in the eyes of certain scriptures, I'll not name it. I don't want to suffer the consequences or let's say the realities of Nupur Sharma. So, assuming that I'm the object of hatred, regardless of who I am, even if I don't pose a threat, even if I don't come in the way of somebody else's existence, and I am being told this over and over again at least three times a day using public speaking systems. You please tell me, am I the one who is causing, causing this particular otherization? Or am I basically saying, I am already othered, plus my existence has been dehumanized. History speaks volumes to this particular effect. The history of this particular subcontinent is the product of dehumanization of the other and the other in this, in this particular case being the native of this land, namely the Hindu. Am I not? expected to at the very least be alive to these historical realities and speak for my own protection? If the answer is no, I am being told that I must effectively subject myself to surrender, which is something that I am not for. And therefore, I am asking for the revival of the martial spirit, but in the interest of self-defense, not in the interest of preemptive action or wanton violence against any community. That is my position. But at a time when already you have so many so, so, so much of polarization right. in society, so much rage, so much, so many uh, avenues that are blocked correct, for self-expression that sometimes rage is the only way you can express yourself. Is that not somewhat dangerous? Sure, but the burden should not be on the Hindu community alone. Given that they are majority? Burden. So? No, no, hold on, hold on. So this because... Goes back to the victimhood. That's exactly what I'm coming yeah. to. The existence of the Hindu community in the majority does not mean that we have a greater responsibility to preserve peace. This is the false narrative and particularly as a community which has suffered at the hands of invaders and colonizers. I'm sorry, the burden cannot be is no more on us. We have done away with one third of our land by way of Pakistan and Bangladesh. What more is expected of this community? Not, never again would be the policy at this stage. And it goes back to a very different connotation altogether. So I'm making this very clear statement and I'm happy to quote instances from the constant assembly debates where they clearly said, 
while the majority will be cognizant of the rights of the minority so that they are treated at par with them when it comes to constitutional rights. This treatment and this particular extension of, let's say, of, of goodwill cannot be a one-way street and it is up to the minority to also ensure that it conducts itself in a way that public morality is largely dictated by the majority in every jurisdiction and it conforms to public morality. Remember, this conversation is happening in the aftermath of the vivisection of this country with millions of lives being lost. So today the burden still cannot be on us. I am certainly no representative for Hindus, I don't speak for them. I will certainly represent those Hindus who believe that Hindus have a right to say these things, who believe it is time it is said. So I certainly represent that particular cross-section of Hindus. So I am not saying that let us add to the problem. I am sorry, I am only saying the problem has existed for long. I am only saying at the very least get your head out of the sand and acknowledge these realities and deal with those realities in whatever way possible, staying within the bounds of constitutionality and law. So self-defense, can, uh, can it become vigilantism? So let's put it this way. So vigilant Which would be a problem. Okay, let's look at it this way. If I were to give you a butter knife, how do I know you're not going to use it to slash your own wrist or kill me? It can happen anyway. I am not going to delegitimize the existence of a butter knife because of the possibility of it being misused for some other purpose. Self-defense is clear. To any average person with a reasonable IQ who understands the concept of Atma Raksha, self-defense has a very clear connotation which is when attacked, protect. That's it. It takes perhaps semantic jugglery and a great leap of imagination and the, and the English language, of which I'm a very poor student, to equate self-defense with vigilantism. <laughs> I don't see how that works. <laughs> Let's quickly talk about uh, some of the fictional, uh, fictional niceties that, you've, that you say we have been living with. Yes. And time that we got rid of them. Yes. Could we mention a few? How blunt do you want me to be? Go ahead. Okay. You have a uh, most okay. receptive audience. A few sessions ago, one participant here from Kashmir basically said that a peace movement and a peaceful movement and a non-violent movement secured independence for us. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry, history is completely, it goes against the person who made this statement and I'm happy to discuss facts. The problem is that these are certain realities so, why do I have a problem with this reality? Assume for, the, for a moment that this reality is merely academic and it's been put in the cold storage of history and has absolutely no relevance to my existence today. I don't have a problem with it. A comfortable reality which makes no difference to my life today, its existence I'm not concerned with at all. But if that comfortable reality is used to lull and dull, the sense of self-preservation of the Hindu community as a community, then I will have to call out the bluff that is that uncomfortable reality. And therefore I'm saying at a time when the borders of this particular country, and this is a reality, I'm happy to actually quote facts on this. Multiple news reports have clearly said that there's a massive demographic imbalance when it comes to the border districts of Bihar and all those regions. And I can point out the massive demographic inversion in this particular state also. This is happening in Andhra Pradesh. This is happening in across the country. When this is the case, am I to continue to believe in this uncomfortable reality or let's say this comfortable uh, myth and fiction to my own detriment? I'm not going to. If this were not the case, I don't have a problem with it. But since it is a continuing reality, I have to deal with it. The problem is what we seem to be thinking of is is the scepter of next round of partition or the next wave of partition here at my doorstep? No, it is not. So why are we raking this up? 1947 never happened overnight. It did not even start with the Khilafat movement. It started at least one and a half centuries before. So partition typically happens when there is the right kind of demographic balance or imbalance at play depending on who you represent and what your interests are. It's a question of biding your time. And therefore, being a decent student of history who has done his homework when it comes to this particular subject, I'm saying, I think we are inching and perhaps hurtling in the very same direction. And if it happens after 1947, we have nobody else to blame but ourselves for our own stupidity. So if not the constitution, what? Of course the constitution. 
without a doubt the constitution. The question is not, if not the constitution, what? The question is, what is the constitution's position with respect to the civilization and its right to exist? Hence the topic of the first book, India that is Bharat, coloniality, civilization, constitution, which is, what is the nexus between the civilization's basic impulses and the constitutional morality or the constitutional morality that everybody constantly spews about and pontificates to the Hindu community about? What is the relationship? Is the constitution at loggerheads with the Hindu philosophy, with Hindu civilization and its basic rights of existence? If yes, should the constitution be reconsidered? Should we go back to the drawing board stage? Should it, uh, should it hit reset? Your next question to that will be, then what happens to others? Right? Okay. No, my next question is, then... Then why? what? Yeah. Then what? My entire submission has been, the existence of others in this country predates the constitution of 1950. So it is not the constitution that has safeguarded the existence of others here. It is the fact that the majority is largely peace-loving and is accommodating as long as the others don't come in the way of our existence and our way of life, period. As simple as that. Now, therefore, therefore, assuming that we go back to the hit reset stage and the drawing board stage and I come out with a Dharmic Republic 2.0 and I say this republic, it needs a revisitation, it is still not going to result in what people typically, uh, let's say, project by way of fear-mongering, a Nazification of Bharat. No, that's not going to happen. Because you're effectively comparing the European supremacist with Hindus. That's such an injustice to people who are victims of colonization and European supremacy. So we are not made in that particular mold, we are not made that way. Take it, okay, let's, let's ask ourselves a simple question. Dr. Ambedkar is effectively known to have pushed for population exchange, complete population transfer after 1947. Now he is apparently being quoted by those who bat for minority rights, I don't know how that works. Now second, let's look at it this way. Despite the horror of partition, despite the specific religious basis for the two-nation theory, and I would say the founding fathers of the two-nation theory had a very clear scriptural basis. They quoted the chapter and verse from that particular scripture. Despite that, did it see a mass wave of genocide against this particular community after 1947? Did that happen? Can the entire, let's say you summon the entire army and all the police forces across the country, are they enough to deal with the Hindu community if the Hindu community decides to pick up the weapon? in 1947 had they done so. Not possible. Because there was no such reason to fear such a backlash. In popular, let's say, representation in pop culture, you have had Noshad, you have had uh, Rafi, you have had Dilip Kumar. People constantly say, no, he had to change his name from Yusuf Khan to Dilip Kumar because of the atmosphere then. Well, there are so many other people, including directors such as Mehboob, who did not have to change their names. How is that possible unless and until this is fundamentally an accepting community? So give this I community... I thought you didn't like Bollywood. <laughs> Let's just say there are portions... You're a great of opponent of it. The good part of being me is that I'm not predictable. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very difficult for anybody to actually say, this is his position and this is where we're going to pin him down. I'll have a clear proviso clause according to a lawyer's uh, vocabulary. You're a good lawyer as well. <laughs> great. Uh, may I ask for a couple of questions quickly? Uh, uh, we have uh, Sai here and I'm sure a lot of people will, will, want, quest uh, yeah, will want to ask. Please, take the mic, please. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sir, uh, how can we contribute to this indigenization as a common man? How can I take part in this transformation, sir? See, first of all, I would suggest that... See, okay, how do I answer this question? A lot of people actually think that my call is for everybody to jump into this either through the legal profession or whatever it is. I, I don't think I'm making that statement at all. First thing is, in your own personal lives, independent of whether there is any other religious identity in this country or not, let there be a genuine attempt to understand your own faith and your own roots. It makes very little sense to become more Hindu merely because the Muslim is more Muslim. I don't think that should be the competition we should be indulging in. That makes really no sense. He follows his faith or she follows her faith. The question is, are you committed to your faith independent of what others are doing with respect to their faith? So, 
my, perhaps my first call is be true to your own roots as much as possible. Try and understand your own history as much as possible. Obviously, this, is no, this has got no economic ROI. There is no return on investment in this. This is purely out of self-interest if you're interested in preserving your roots. That's it. That's point number one. Two, after a long time, I think we are, we are at an interesting juncture where social media garbage is competing with fantastic works being put out by people through books. Both these movements are happening side by side. Choose the right side. I'm not using right for a different reason. I'm just saying choose the right side. Okay? Put more faith in facts. Cultivate a greater sense of reading. And try and educate and have conversations on, let's say, on campuses, in office spaces, wherever possible. The biggest problem today is not political stifling of any particular opinion, but the percolation of cancel culture from the West in Bharat society. Which is, if I want to discuss the Sabarimala issue in, let's say, a certain campus in Bangalore or in Chennai or certain places, I cannot hope to get out of that place in one piece because of the opinions I hold. That is the unfortunate reality of this country today. That is the same case with any other issue. So I think we need to be able to come out with platforms or let's say, or let's say some kind of solutions where it is possible to engage in these conversations and hopefully present our positions with some kind of substantial basis. Let opinions not precede facts, let facts come first, give facts an opportunity to breathe, which means it calls for greater homework. That's the first thing. Second. Therefore, attend more platforms like ours. <laughs> I'll just take one point, just one final point. Two. I think all of these conversations are useless if they are entirely relegated to the political realm. The one institution which I think has been misunderstood and misrepresented is the temple and underrepresented and disenfranchised. Try and see what you can do to that institution, not to compete with anybody else for anything else, but because it is that particular nerve center, which is the product of your civilization's journey after several millennia of understanding, it has a lot of role to play. Try and revive its centrality in your lives, and maybe you have better solutions to offer. Wonderful. Um, another question quickly, and then we can, yeah, please. Hi. Uh, so you have said that Hinduism is a way of life. The yes. beliefs that you hold is a way of life. Right. As a lawyer, I wanted to understand what your stance would be on girls who have uh, who've been asked in Karnataka to remove their hijabs and because of which their education has been in impacted. There have been reports that have come out that hundreds of girls have been forced to quit education because of you know something that they believe is a way of their life. Right. has been snatched away from them. Right. So as a lawyer, what's your stance? So when the controversy broke out, my initial reaction was, ye phir se naya controversy kya hai? what is this each time something happens? I am also alive to the active involvement of the PFI in instigating this particular issue. But let us look at it independent of that for a moment. Generally speaking, if my position were asked, I would say, my only question, let's say point of inquiry would be, if I were to oppose the wearing of the hijab on school campuses and college campuses, if it happens to be government aided, and if I had a cousin or if I had a child who wants to observe the Ayapatiksha and still go to school wearing the black dress, will he also be restricted from observing those practices and wearing those symbols because it happens to be a government aided institution? And from that perspective, I decided to spell out my position to say, Uniform plus hijab, I don't see a problem. As long as the basic dress code exists, and over and above that you have the hijab, I don't have a problem with it. Because I don't subscribe to the militant notions of secularism under any circumstances. That's a position I've consciously taken. One of the arguments that I've also presented is, in secular spaces or in public spaces, is where people must have the right to wear their symbols because they're also announcing their presence and existence as a community. So there I don't have a problem. Because one of the questions I also ask myself is, if tomorrow someone were to support the shikha and go to that institution, shikha obviously has a religious connotation. Would he be asked to chop off the shikha? Or to say that your, the shirt that you're wearing is so translucent that your genuine is visible, so I think you need to do something about it? 
I am therefore looking at that issue from the perspective of will the position come back to haunt me and affect me with respect to my practices. I am in that particular sense parochial or bigot, whatever you can call it, it's okay, no problem. These are all the labels which I am happily willing to swallow and accept. So going from that perspective in the interest of preserving my own ability to wear my identity wherever. So it's like this, come to the Supreme Court, you will see Vibhutis, you will see the Vaishnav Tika or other Tilak. You will see the shikhas, you will see hijabs, you will see beards, you will see the pagdis, you will see representations across the board. If the Supreme Court can have it, which is supposed to be a secular institution, at least on paper, why can't a school have it? Let's look at it from that perspective. And the question would also be, from the, we, we usually uh, apply this principle called the harm principle. Who is it affecting? How is it exactly affecting? So if the hijab is not worn, will the teacher not know that the student is a Muslim? How are you going to take the roll call when it comes to attendance then? If the idea is to somehow pixelate the student's religious identity from the teacher's attention, is the wearing of the hijab the only thing that's going to proclaim the person's identity? No. So I am not here batting for the pro-hijab community here. <laughs> Let me be clear. I am merely saying my position on the hijab is based on if I were to take an anti-hijab position in a secular institution, what is it going to do to the ability of Hindus to wear their own symbols in secular institutions? As, as he said, he's uh, uh, totally unpredictable <laughs> and he's proved that with this answer as well. Thank you so much, Sai. It's always asked. such a pleasure to sorry, sir, sorry. Uh, Okay, quickly, 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 quickly. Yeah, one line question. Yes, sir. Your views on splitting language from religion. Sorry, what? Your views on splitting language, language from, from religion. religion from religion. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't think the opinion on this subject can be cut and dried. Because after a point what happens is, a language tends to be associated with a particular culture and with a particular religion. So for instance, prior to the advent of Islam, there were no, at least there were not Islamic languages. But those languages have come to be associated with Islam primarily because of its adoption and its, its patronage by rulers who were Muslim in identity. And this is excluding, let's say, uh, Urdu. Turkic for that matter is not exactly an Islamic language, but it has become associated with that particular culture. So I think the relationship is amorphous at the same time, I think it is a real relationship. It's a question of the time frame. So for instance, if you were to go 1400 years ago, you wouldn't have any concept of an Islamic language at all. But post 7th century CE, clearly certain languages have taken a certain hue. And specifically in the context of Bharat, Urdu and Farsi were seen as Muslim languages by the Muslim community and their leaders and their political organizations and cultural organizations, so much so that from the 1860s onwards, apart from this two-nation theory having its own religious basis, it had a very strong linguistic basis. You had defense organizations being set up by Sayyid Ahmad Khan for the defense of Urdu in upper parts of Bharat. And this started happening across the country. So I think it's difficult to say that language has no religion because at the end of the day it captures the journey of a particular culture and if culture has perhaps a decent relationship with religion, it's impossible to do away with the relationship between language and religion. So I follow up maybe too much because Kaviriji has always been gracious with me and she's always given me an opportunity to, give, to spell out my point of view. I don't want to take her time for granted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you, Sai.